So hi everyone, good morning from Jerusalem. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, even though it's on Zoom. I would like to thank the organizers for putting this nice meeting together. So I'm going to talk today about um, QMMM, QMMM simulations in the excited states, which are applied to a system called Rhodopsin. And so since not everyone might be familiar with this, with this protein, I will make a brief introduction. So rhodopsins constitute a large family of photoreceptor proteins, and they basically can be categorized in two different types. Type one is so-called microbial rhodopsins. They function as ion pumps, ion channels, and also enzymes, and they undergo a photocycle. And this photocycle is triggered by um, the isomerization of the chromophore, which you can see here, this is the all trans retinol. Uh, upon absorption of light, it converts to a certain cis, and this starts a, a cascade of chemical reactions, which eventually leads to the desired function. Now, the second type is called animal rhodopsins, and the animal rhodopsins have a different function. They're usually visual, they, they are responsible for the visual and non visual phototransduction. And in this type of rhodopsin, the chromophore retinal is present in the 11 cis um, conformation, and then it's converted to all trans. Now, in contrast to microbial rhodopsins, it doesn't undergo a photocycle. Instead, it shows a photocascade. So it means there's a series of chemical transformations, and at the end, it does not regenerate the 11 cis. Instead, the retinal is cleaved and it leaves the, the protein binding point. So this was the understanding and, 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 and the categorization until very recently. Uh, actually, in, in two years ago, uh, the group of Odet Beja, who is an uh, uh, environmental microbiologist, they make a discovery of a new type of rhodopsin. And this rhodopsin is called best rhodopsin. It's not, the name, the name is not due to the, well, because it's the best rhodopsin, but it's because this rhodopsin is found in a fusion with another protein called bestrophin. So there are two different types. One is called rhodopsin bestrophin, RB. So there is one monomer of rhodopsin fused to one monomer of bestrophin. And the second type has two, retina, two rhodopsin domains in tandem, which again are linked to bestrophin. So shortly after the discovery of this uh, new protein family, uh, the group of Marshall and Benami from the Weizmann Institute solved the cryo-M structure. So as you can see here, the, um, each rhodopsin domain has eight transmembrane helices, which are linked to each other. And then through a long linker, they are connected to the bestrophin. So this is how the structure looks like. This bestrophin rhodopsin is a pentamer. So in the middle, you see five units of bestrophin forming an ion channel. And then in, uh, in the periphery, you have a link of two different rhodopsin domains. And this is how it looks from the side. You see that the first rhodopsin domain is directly linked to the upper part of the bestrophin channel. But the outer domain has also a long linker. You see it here in cyan, which is linked to, to the bottom of the bestrophin channel. So in addition to this impressive and highly complex structure, it has very unusual photochemical properties. Here is a summary slide. You see on the right side, on the right side, you see different bestrophins. They're also ubiquitous. For example, you have this channel in bacteria. You have it also in animals. They look very similar. And on the, on the left side, you see a summary of different rhodopsins. So there are two interesting features which stand out for this best trough infusion. First, uh, it's considered to be one of the most redshifted rhodopsins. So the, spectra, the, the, the absorption maximum is in 661 nanometers. So this is, besides one single exception, this is the most redshifted rhodopsin ever reported. And it almost reaches the transparency window, which is highly, highly desired by uh, many um, neuroscientists and, and, and for biomedical applications. And so the question is, 
um, how is it possible that the same chromophore in a different environment is having such a strong shift in the absorption maximum? And the second question is regarding the unusual isomerization mechanism, because as I mentioned in the previous slide, usually animal rhodopsins um, isomerize from 11 cis to all trans, microbial go from all trans to 13 cis, but this new type um, starts with retinol in the all trans conformation and converts it to 11 cis. So it seems that it has a really unique mechanism and unique way to control the isomerization. So we are going to, I'm going to address these two questions in, in, in my presentation. So the first part is regarding the spectral tuning in this trophin. And as spectral tuning, we call um, the effect of the environment to, um, to shift the absorption maximum of the chromophore. So here you see an image or a visualization of the binding pocket. The green elongated molecule, this is retinol. It is covalently bound to a lysine and it carries a positive charge. And this positive charge is surrounded by three counter ions. These are carboxylates, side chains of aspartate and uh, glutamate. They carry a negative charge. That's why they're called counter ions. And this is extremely unusual because a typical retinal or adopsins have one or two counter ions, but this is the only one that carries three counter ions. So and indeed, when the experimental absorption spectrum was reported, uh, it was found that the spectrum have a very high pH dependence. So at, um, at the pH value of seven, the absorption maximum is 661. But if you go to higher pH, as you can see here, at the value of nine, then the absorption spectrum is shifting towards 562 nanometers. And then if you go to very high pH, you can get 362. And in case the um, uh, in case the um, the retinal is uh, sorry the protein is degraded, you have a free retinal which is leaving the the protein binding pocket and it absorbs around 377. Okay, so now I want to give you a quick um, like historical background about studies of spectral tuning in rhodopsins and what is the predominant mechanism. I think it started in 1975 by the seminal work by Salem and Brookman. This was still the time where you could publish purely computational studies in nature. And they found out that upon twisting of double bonds, there is a migration of the positive charge which sits on this nitrogen and it moves towards the beta anion ring. So this model was then further refined in 78 by Ari Warshall. And he did then full size retinal calculation and he found indeed in the excited state, there is a migration, there is a uh, intermolecular, uh, sorry, intramolecular charge transfer. And due to this charge transfer, the bond length alternation is changing in the excited state. And then the, um, the actual spectral tuning me mechanism was proposed in 1979 by Barry Honig and Nakanishi and co workers. And it's just interesting to, to know, interesting because uh, at the time, Barry Honig was at the Hebrew University where I am right now. So they proposed something called the external point charge model. And what this model was, uh, I mean, and, and I'm going to explain now this model in more detail. So here is the chemical structure of retinol. We have here two parts. This is the shift base nitrogen, which carries the positive charge. And the other side is the beta ion ring. So upon excitation in the, in the first excited state, the positive charge moves from the, um, from the shift based nitrogen to the beta ion ring. And so um, we can also visualize this um, charge distribution projected on van der Waals spheres representing retinal. And you can clearly see there's more blue on the right side where the nitrogen is. And then in the excited state, this um, blue color moves more to the ring. So, but how does it, how is it connected with the spectral tuning? Well, each charge distribution is uh, linked to a different energy level. And then the difference between these two energy levels is the excitation energy, which is related to absorption maximum. 
And so now if you consider the environment, for example, we take into account a counter line, which has a negative charge, then it's clear that this counter line is going to stabilize the ground state more than the excited state. Okay, so we have here bigger stabilization of the ground state compared to the excited state. And the reason for this is because the ground state has more positive charge in the vicinity of the counter ion. So this differential stabilization to the increase of the energy gap. And this in turn uh, results in the blue shift. So then if you if for example you put you place a negatively charged residue on the other side, then you're going to stabilize the excited state more than the ground state because simply because there is more positive charge in the better non ring in the excited state. So this will lead to a short, I mean, to, to smaller energy gap and therefore a redshift. And you can play this kind of games with different charges and different residues. So now, according to this external point charge model by Honig, actually three counter ends close to the shift base would result in a very large blue shift, but we are observing a red shift. So I will explain in a few slides the reason for this. Uh, but before this, I wanted to mention that these papers in the 70s, they were um, highly, they were all theoretical computational papers. And only recently, five years ago, um, together with uh, the group of Lars Anderson and Yoni Tucker, we were able to show that indeed this prediction is correct by studying the retinal experimentally in the gas phase. So they have taken the group of Lars Anderson and Yoni Tucker, they took this charged retinal and they, they, they measured the absorption spectrum in the gas phase. So you see the blue spectrum here is the experimental value of just the retinal. And then they added this Twitter ionic uh, molecule. This is betaine, in which is supposed to mimic the counter ion. And once you add the counter ion in the gas phase, so you have only the retinal and only one counter ion, you see a strong blue shift. This is the purple spectrum. And we have reproduced these uh, results and we have computed. You see the sticks at our calculations. So it turns out that um, these three counter ions are not all deprotonated. And depending on the protonation states, we can ex explain the different peaks. So if two of the three counters are protonated and some of them are actually sharing a proton, then we can get a, a very high um, redshift. And then if one of the three is protonated, then indeed we have an additional negative charge. Then we indeed observe a blue shift according to the point charge model. And then if all three are deprotonated, then actually um, the shift base nitrogen is losing a proton. This proton is going to the counter ion, and then the deprotonated shift base absorbs at around 360. So we were able to explain the strong redshift by different protonation patterns of the three counter ions. So this was the first part regarding the spectral tuning. And now um, I'm going to talk about the second part, the unusual photoisomerization. So this is the photo cycle of this new bestrophin rhodopsin. You see RRB 661. This is the label for the dark state or the parental state before excitation. And it carries the all trans retinal. And then once you excite it, it forms the first intermediate, which is called the K intermediate. And then there is a series of uh, intermediates and eventually it's fully converted and regenerates the RRB. So now uh, the initial assessment of the photocycle was done by the group of Kiichi Inui in Japan and they measured the pho flash photolysis. However, they were not, they, they observed after some time in the N intermediate, they observed the presence of the 11 cis uh, conformer of retinal. However, they were not sure if this is really the primary product. Maybe along this intermediates, they could get some isomerization for, for different double bond. So the question was, is it possible for the all trans retina to isomerize directly to 11 cis? Because this is really against the classical um, types of 
microbial and visual rhodopsins. This is really an unusual outcome. So in order to study this, we have performed something called the relax scan. So where we have um, in stepwise fixed the, the heat angle of either the 11, 12 double bond, which is found to be isomerized, or the 13, 14 double bond. And then we, in steps of 10 degrees, we optimize each bond and relax the remaining part of the protein. So what we found in this relaxed scan, uh, starting from the um, Frank Conan point, is that in one direction, namely in the clockwise direction, there is a very high barrier. And it means that it's unlikely that retinol is going to isomerize either around 11, 12 or the 13, 14 double bond. However, in the counterclockwise direction, we found that the barrier is significantly smaller. And indeed, 11, 12 double bond rotation shows a much uh, shows a slightly smaller barrier in the excited state than the 13, 14. So it looks like it's going to be uh, preferred over 13, 14. So uh, when you when you measure the highest point, you find that for the counterclockwise rotation of the 11, 12 double bond, the barrier is 2.5, roughly 2.5 kcal per mole. For 13, 14, it's 6 kcal per mole. Now, we found these values. However, we, we didn't understand, or we wanted to get a, a mechanistic insight. Why is this barrier so, so low for 11, 12? And why is it high for 13, 14? So then in the next step, we um, created an over, we overlaid all these geometries from the relaxed scan from the retinal, and we visualized the, um, the protein environment using a, uh, this one of our sphere representation. So what we found is that actually the rotation of the 13, 14 double bond, which is here, is hindered because there is a methyl group. And this methyl group is sterically clashing with the methionine residue. This side chain here, which has a, um, a sulfur and the methyl group at the end, this is the methionine. And then on the other side, however, we found a very small uh, uh, group, which is an alanine. So then we suggested to make a protein mutation. And we removed this methionine in the position 735. And we replace it with a much smaller residue called alanine. And this should basically remove the barrier and allow the 1314 double bond to isomerize. So then we recalculated for this mutant. We have recomputed re the relaxed scan. We still see a large barrier for the clockwise rotation. However, for the counterclockwise rotation, we see a change. Now the 1314 and the 1112 isomerization have very similar barriers. And also the conical intersection is comparable. So when we look at the data, indeed, the 13-14 double bond has a slightly smaller barrier, which is, however, still considerable. So it's 4.5 kcal per mole. And for 11-12, it's almost 6 kcal per mole. So then we wanted to go one step further. And we proposed also to mutate a second residue. And uh, the residue that you saw here on the left side is an alanine. And now we replace this alanine with methionine. So basically, we introduce this bulky group on this side and a small group on this side. And then we could observe in this double mutant, we could observe indeed um, that now the barrier for the 13-14 double bond isomerization is significantly smaller than before. And it's also uh, um, still smaller than 11-12. So now this is our proposal. Um, that we have shared with uh, our experimental collaborator. Um, we propose to synthesize this double mutation, and then we might be able to change the, the selectivity of the isomerized bond. OK, so these were um, static calculations. And we heard already during this meeting several um, presentations about molecular dynamics, especially non-adiabatic dynamics, including surface hopping. So we decided to check um, whether we really also see from dynamic simulation whether we can whether retinal can isomerize from all trans to 11 cis. So for this purpose, we um, 
since we are dealing with conical intersections and um, non-adiabatic transitions, we have to rely on multi-reference methods. And in the past, uh, the working course for this kind of simulation was the CASA-CF method. And this method is pretty good in describing conical intersections. However, it only accounts for static electron correlation. So it doesn't give you quantitative energies. Then on the other hand, there is this spectro there is this method which can give you accurate spectroscopic values. Um, and this method is called um, complete active space perturbation theory second order. So this is a correction that you can apply on top of the CASA CF wave function. And this includes or recovers dynamic electron correlation. However, until very recently, until very recently, this method was only for only for single point calculations because it was computationally very demanding. And only recently, a few years ago, um, it became available in addition with analytic gradients in the Bagel program, which is developed by Toro Shiozaki and Jebu Park, who is going to give a talk, I think, in two days. So they, they made this. Uh, I, <laughs> they make this analytic gradients and CASPD2 um, available and feasible to do dynamics. So we have performed, as, a, as an initial benchmark, we have performed um, trajectory calculation for bacterial rhodopsin. And uh, because bacterial rhodopsin is considered to be like, this is like the hydrogen, at, the hydrogen molecule of you know, proteins. So it's a very well studied system. And here we know that I summarized from all trans to 36. So now I'm going to show you this trajectory. You see on the inset, this is the excited set energy. In blue, you have the ground set energy. And when they come across, this is the, uh, the, the transition. And the green point is uh, the actual point on the uh, surface at the time of the dynamics. So we're starting from all trans retinal. Now I'm going to press play, and you see now the dynamic started. Um, you will see that one we, once we are passing through the conical intersection, there is a twist of 90 degrees. And once we are on the ground state, this retina is fully isomerized, and it forms the 13 cis. So it seems that it's really performing well. And then now we applied the same methodology to, uh, to this bestrophin rhodopsin, the new type. And here you see the results. Here you see in orange the retina. In starting in the old trans conformation, I'm going to press play, and you see the value of the dihedral value of the dihedral angle. So maybe it was a little bit too fast, but you basically see that starting from 100 minus 179, it ends up in minus 60. So it has I summarized from all trans to uh, 11 cis, and if you continue the trajectory further, we will see that it really forms uh, the close to uh, at the hydral angle close to zero. So here's another view from the side. You see that upon excitation we have this quick uh, stretching of the double bond, and then after a while we form this this cis. So indeed, it isomerizes around 11 cis in contrast to bacterial rhodopsin, which isomerize around 13 cis. And now we have confirmed it using surface hopping dynamics, but we still didn't fully understand what's the reason behind this change in the double bond selectivity. So and then while we were researching and comparing it to experiments, there was um, a recent review by the group of uh, Ren Zhong from University of Chicago. Uh, he analyzed time-resolved crystallography data. And he found, if you look on the, on the bottom graph here, he found that actually in the initial phase of the photoisomerization, there are several double bonds, as you can see here, which are highly twisted. So somehow, at the very beginning, the, the double bonds are, are highly distorted, and the sample the conformational space in the binding pocket. But for some reason, there is something in the protein which selects one double bond over the other for the continuation of the, of the rotation. And then we came across several papers um, from the groups of uh, Massimo Livucci, Marco Garavelli, and Todd Martinez. They have, back in 2004 and 2006, they have uh, independently proposed that in the protein environment, there might be some counter ion 
So a negative charge, and here it's illustrated by a chloride ion, ion that will stabilize the conical intersection um, for a specific double bond. So here you see in this in this model on top, um, the chloride is close to the shift base, and it then it makes it uh, causes the 13, 14 double bond to isomerize. And then if it becomes more closer to the center of this model, then this 11, 12 double bond isomerizes. So this is a nice model. However, in, in, in Bestrophin rhodopsin, there was no counter ion in the middle, close to 11, 12 double bond. However, we found a residue. We found a tyrosine residue. So it has a hydroxyl group here. And this hydroxyl group is interestingly oriented towards the carbon uh, 10 and carbon 11 of the retinol. So it's very close to the bond of, to the double bond 11, 12, which I summarized. And then we mon monitored it during the trajectory. And indeed, during the isomerization, during this excited state trajectory, the distance is getting closer and the tyrosine is approaching the isomerizing bond. So now we believe that this uh, amino acid is responsible for the selectivity. And we make another proposal to experimentalists to replace the tyrosine residue by phenylalanine. Phenylalanine has the same side chain, except that the hydroxyl group here is replaced by hydrogen. So it won't have the oxygen in this position. And this might change and impact the selectivity of the double bond. OK, with this, um, I, I'm at the end of my presentation. I would like to acknowledge I would like to acknowledge my coworkers, funding, and also my collaborators, Oded Beja from the Technion, who found this interesting rhodopsin, and Moran Shalev Benami, who provided the cryovamp structure. Thank you for your attention, and I will be happy to take questions. I was muted, sorry. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, I have one short question. Uh, do you also include kind of uh, solvent defect in your simulation? Uh, uh, you're muted. Uh, so in our case, sorry, no, it's yeah. So in our case, the chromophore is embedded in, in the protein environment. So uh -huh. If you if you wish the the protein is the solvent. Ah okay. Ah, okay. So okay. There, there are only inside inside the binding pocket there are a few water molecules which are also included but it's mostly protein environment. Ah uh, okay I see. Uh, and the, about the scanning the conical cross section. So do do you scan the potential energy sur surface uh, by constraining the spin state or it, it was just a simul a spontaneously converted from uh, from uh, converted its spin state from excited to uh, another state. So the relax scan we have done the relax scan we have done using uh, TDDFT using Cambis relief, uh -huh. but the search of the conical section was done using XMS Caspid2. Uh, okay. So we have used the program for Todd Martinez called CIOPT. And this, okay. and then we uh, we optimize the conical intersection. Oh, okay. um, I'm not sure regarding the spin state because both the grounds and the excited state are both singlet state. So oh, okay. and it's done using XMS Caspid2. So we didn't we don't have the problem of okay I missed it. I of missed it. change of the spin state. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So let's thank for the speaker and.